More and more animal shelters are choosing to remove breed labels. Arizona State University conducted a study that revealed that when a dog was labeled as something other than a pit bull, it was adopted in, quote, one-third of the time. Shelters want to see more pit bulls being adopted, so instead of listing the dog's breed, what they're doing now is giving a more detailed outline of the dog's personality and history, which they claim is what truly makes up the dog. A lot of people are very unhappy about this, and so I thought I would make a video to share my thoughts about it. Years ago, I had a friend. She was a pit bull owner. I actually brought my children to her house when her pit bull was a puppy and let my kids play with it. I didn't know better. At the time, I didn't know what to think about pit bulls. I knew they were controversial. I knew some people advocated for them while others wanted them banned. I wasn't armed with enough information, though, to form an opinion one way or another. My friend was an intelligent professional, and I valued her opinions. I just hadn't given it much thought. I was neutral on the issue. Then, I began to do some research after Montreal suspended a controversial pit bull ban back in 2017, and people were losing their minds. I wanted to get the facts so that I could form my own opinion. So I did a lot of reading and a lot of research. And what I learned was that pit bulls are responsible for nearly three quarters of all fatal dog attacks. I learned that the dog's upbringing is no indicator of whether or not it will attack someone because there are countless reports of well-socialized, well-trained pit bulls that were raised in loving homes and never abused, that were the sweetest dogs for many years until one day they weren't and they snapped and ripped someone's face off or worse. I learned their bite is different from other dogs. They were bred to bait bulls and fight, bred to attack unprovoked without showing any warning signs, bred to clamp down and shake their victim and not let go until their victim is dead. Other dogs bite, but they let go. Pit bulls don't let go, and that's why they do so much damage. They were bred for what they call gameness. Gameness is the quality of fighting dogs and working terriers that are selectively bred and conditioned from a very early age to develop traits of eagerness despite the threat of substantive injury. Other dogs will bite you, but they will not clamp down with the determination and ferocity of a pit bull. They won't shake their victim. I learned that beating pit bulls with blunt objects or even stabbing them does not make them let go of their victims. In fact, pain only intensifies their attacks. I learned they were jumping off balconies to attack kids. They were digging under fences, climbing over fences, opening sliding doors, running across the street, and even jumping into parked cars to attack kids in their car seats. They were attacking kids at bus stops or kids walking to school. They were attacking and killing people who were simply out going for a walk, minding their own business. None of these children or adults were provoking the dogs in any way. I began to search for reports where the victim actually provoked the dog, but they were nearly impossible to find. Sometimes the person reached under the table to pet the dog and got attacked. Is that a provocation? Sometimes the dog was startled by a cough or a seizure. Is that a provocation? A sudden noise or movement. Is that a provocation? These dogs were being provoked by the most trivial of things, actions which a person should be able to perform without running the risk of having a major artery severed or a limb ripped off. Another thing I learned about pit bulls was that there was a lot of confusion surrounding the breed, with people saying that the pit bull isn't even a breed, and that many different breeds fall under the pit bull label. Dog lovers always bring up the fact that either there's no such thing as a pit bull, or they'll say most people cannot correctly identify a pit bull. Lots of confusion. And that is a major point in their argument against breed-specific legislation, or BSL. Quoting from an article published by OneGreenPlanet.org, which I will link you to, Determining a dog's breed isn't easy. Even those who work with dogs for a living and are exposed to seeing a variety of breeds and mixes can have difficulty guessing a dog's genetic makeup. A dog with a square head, short ears, and a solid muscular body might appear to be one of the breeds that falls under the pit bull label, but that isn't necessarily the case. End quote. 
So we have a whole bunch of reports of serious and fatal dog attacks, with the pit bull listed as the breed implicated in the vast majority of them. And pit bull lovers are saying you can't put any weight into these statistics because people can't properly identify a pit bull, or they say the pit bull isn't even a breed. But the people identifying these dogs are calling them pit bulls because they have a square head, short ears, and a solid muscular body. So shouldn't we just go by that? Forget breed names. Why not just go by physical appearance? If the dogs doing the most damage have boxy square heads, that's how the victims identify them. If the majority of dogs implicated in serious dog bites and dog attacks and fatalities have boxy square heads, short ears, and muscular bodies, isn't that all we need to know? Why do we even care about the breed name? The fact is, dogs that have this appearance are doing most of the maiming and killing, by far. All the different breeds that look like this and could be misidentified as a pit bull are all athletic, strong, powerful dogs that can do serious damage if they snap. These breeds were developed for blood sports, either as fighting dogs or bull baiting dogs. And that is why they have the physical characteristics they have. They are all genetically programmed to be aggressive and have the behavioral traits I described, such as gameness, which set them apart from other dogs and pose a huge risk to public health. It doesn't matter which herding breed it is, it will have the propensity to herd. Any breed that was bred for herding will instinctively display herding behavior, no matter how you raise or train it. Everyone agrees on this. Likewise, it doesn't matter which fighting breed it is, any breed that was bred to fight will have the propensity to attack unprovoked and inflict serious injury. It will not matter how you raise or train it. Those instincts are bred into them and are an intrinsic part of what they are. This is just a fact. So one day, I made a Facebook post and I proposed my solution to this pit bull problem. I said something to the effect of, I don't discriminate. Not only should any dog with a boxy square head, short ears, and a muscular body be banned, all large, powerful breeds should be banned. We should ban every breed that's ever been involved in a serious injury or death of a person. Preferably ban all dogs, because they are all contributing to the major dog waste problem, the major noise pollution problem. But let's start with the dogs that can seriously injure or kill us. Well, you can imagine the reaction I got to that post. The friend I mentioned, who had the pit bull puppy, was very offended by this, which truly at the time I didn't understand. It just seemed logical to me to say what I said. I wasn't trying to offend her or anyone. If you really want a dog, why can't you get a small dog that is incapable of inflicting serious injury? Is public health not more important than your right to own a dangerous dog? Well, she was never the same with me after that, and we grew distant and are no longer friends. But I still say, I don't discriminate. We need to ban all breeds that have been implicated in serious or fatal attacks on humans. Dogs such as the Rottweiler, which was implicated in 10.4% of fatal attacks between the years 2005 and 2017. Huskies are known as crib snatchers because they have so often attacked and killed babies as they slept in their cribs. German Shepherds pop up regularly in the reports, as do Mastiffs. Any dog that is large and powerful enough to cause serious bodily harm should be banned. I've never heard of a Maltese or a Cocker Spaniel maiming or killing anyone. Why can't dog lovers just get dogs like that? Small to medium-sized breeds that were not bred to be aggressive. So getting back to animal shelters, instead of listing the dog's breed, animal shelters are trying to get people to adopt pit bulls which would otherwise be overlooked or spend ages in the shelter by giving a more detailed outline of the dog's personality and history, which they claim is what truly makes up the dog. This is false. What we see here is another example of the dog cult being manipulative and dishonest. They are on a mission to save dogs, to get people to adopt dogs. They believe they are doing good and important work. 
And so they feel it's fine to manipulate, deceive, and lie to people if it helps them accomplish their lofty goal. For them, the end always justifies the means. They feel no guilt or shame whatsoever about lying to people. Well, I'm here to tell you the truth, and I hope that you will share this video and share the truth with others so that it spreads like a wildfire. The dog's history is no indicator of whether or not it will end up seriously injuring or killing someone in an unprovoked attack, nor is its personality an indicator of this. The true indicator of how likely the dog is to seriously injure or kill a person is its appearance, not its breed, but its appearance. Any dog with a boxy, squarish head and a muscular body needs to be avoided like the plague. Because dogs with that appearance are implicated in the majority of serious and deadly dog attacks, regardless of their personality or how they were raised. When people go shopping for a dog, and that's what it is, they aren't rescuing a dog. They're going out shopping for a dog because they want a dog. There's nothing virtuous about this. It's a selfish act undertaken so that they will feel they are good people doing a good deed. When in actuality, they are doing the community a huge disservice by contributing to the massive problem of dog waste and dog barking. Not to mention raising the risk of someone in their family or community being attacked or killed by their dog. They are also putting their family and community at risk of acquiring a bacterial, viral or parasitic disease from the dog. So it is not a virtuous act. It's the opposite. It is an irresponsible, immoral act which should be condemned and made illegal. It should be as taboo as drunk driving is. Sure, not every drunk driver injures or kills a person. In fact, the vast majority don't, but they do raise the risk of serious injury and death. Just like dog lovers do when they choose to get a large, powerful dog. It doesn't matter if it's a pit bull or not, or if there even is such a thing as a pit bull. It's all irrelevant. What you find out when you read the reports of dog attacks is that the dogs usually had a great personality and were the sweetest dogs for years until one day they weren't. So the dog's personality doesn't mean a thing. Dogs that the general public would correctly or incorrectly identify as pit bulls, dogs with a boxy head and a muscular body, dogs with that general appearance pose the biggest threat because pit bull or not, they are the ones being identified in nearly three quarters of all fatal dog attacks. Bringing one of these boxy headed mutants into your home or into the community is like playing Russian roulette. One of these dogs may never show any aggression and be the sweetest dog all of its life. It may be the sweetest dog you've ever known until the day it dies. Another will be the sweetest dog for two years, four years, eight years, until one day out of the blue, it attacks and seriously injures or kills someone because they dropped a glass or coughed or happened to be sitting in a car seat or asleep in their bassinet. This has nothing to do with how the dog is raised. It has nothing to do with the dog's personality. They are ticking time bombs and you just never know which one is going to explode or when. So it's up to us to be informed and inform others and protect ourselves from the trickery and deceit of these animal shelters and dog cult members who care more for dogs than human life. People say it's unfair to ban certain breeds. Do you want to know what's unfair? What's unfair is forcing the public to put up with the unnecessary increased risk of sustaining severe bodily injury or dying by having no choice but to share the community with dogs that are biting over 2,000 people every day just in the USA, biting them badly enough for them to seek medical attention for their wounds. 77 people are undergoing reconstructive surgery every day in the USA alone due to dog attacks. Do you know what this is? This is terrorism. We are up against a massive, powerful lobby that truly doesn't care if a child is decapitated or dismembered by a dog or an elderly person killed while out for their daily walk. In fact, the dog lovers will often laugh and post pictures of their dogs in comments of such reports and they will attack anyone who has anything bad to say about the offending dog. It's madness. They always blame the human and absolve the dog of any wrongdoing, even if the human was minding their own business and didn't provoke the dog in any way at all. 
Even if the humans did everything right in raising the dog, they will overlook this. Even if the baby was asleep in her crib, it's never the dog's fault. These deranged people have no compassion for humans. Somehow, in their minds, it's always the human's fault. They will never blame the dog. They'll never blame the dog's genetics. The dogs, no matter what they do, will always be revered and worshipped by these people. Dogs will always be pure, innocent, loving, faithful, loyal, devoted, and better than humans. It's truly a frightening state of affairs. The chance of getting through to hardcore dog lovers is slim because they are unable to think clearly. But we can make a difference by reaching those who are not yet fully programmed to worship dogs. Those people who are on the fence, like I once was, without a stake in this, without any strong feelings on the issue, we need to reach those people who are still open to reason. Those people are not yet indoctrinated by the dog cult. We can reach them by raising awareness, standing up to this insanity and speaking out. Those with the ears to hear will hear. I believe we can make a difference in that things are already changing. I read in the Dog Free Reddit group, which now has over 12,000 members, people are saying they're noticing more and more of us speaking out against this insanity, not only in dog-hating groups, but everywhere online. I really think times are beginning to change. I'm hopeful. We are on the cusp of a revolution. With a little more effort on our part, if we all become more vocal, I believe the tables are going to turn very soon, and people are going to wake up. It's inevitable. So don't discriminate. Ban all dogs, starting with the large, powerful breeds. Rise up. The future is dog-free.